So if you look back at, at the history of, of humanity, or if you look at what's left of indigenous people, uh, you quickly come to understand that human beings uh, evolved to live in small, what we call human scale, for a good reason, um, small groups of people, face-to-face -face communication, the experience of being in close communion with other people. If the kind of hunger for materials that speak of a place and, and the human hand and so on are powering natural building right now, there is absolute starvation in the culture as it exists now for community interaction. And so it's a, it's a tremendous need waiting to be met. You know, we have all kinds of synthetic substitutes for community now with these things where people try and get together to do things but the ability to walk out your door and get your required daily dose of human interaction with people who aren't part of your nuclear family is absolutely going unmet and so that's why that the work that's happening up in Portland with the village building convergence and city repair and so on excites people so much because it is the ends toward which natural building was ultimately meant to be. None of the people who have ever lived on this street or who will ever live on this street have ever had a say in how their lives would be organized. None of them ever said, for instance, hey, let's move the functions of living away from the functions of working. Let's disintegrate those things so that when we come home at the end of the day after working with people we don't tend to get to know, let's live among people that we don't tend to get to know. No one ever said, hey, let's make everything bilaterally symmetrical as far as the eye can see, north, south, east, and west, and let's do it to every city west of the Ohio River all the way to the Pacific Ocean. San Diego, Seattle, Portland, St. Louis, Chicago. What effectively happened was the great commons of this land was converted into a commodity. Locating the great commons there in the intersection is just simply to recognize that where our pathways come together, so do our lives. This is the most profound principle of urban design, the intersection. The idea that you enable people to intersect however you can to enable them to communicate and to meet each other, to facilitate events, things that happen. It's about facilitating communication, not just the movement of goods and services, it's about helping people to build relationship. Everything goes on in the piazza, and I suppose you could say conversely that if you don't have a piazza, if your neighborhood doesn't feature even one public square, how much is going to be going on? That principle of build it and they will come, or build it and something will happen, what if it's not there? What if you think you have freedom of assembly and nowhere to assemble? In fact, in the United States, we have fewer outdoor gathering places and indoor gathering places than probably any other country in the history of the world. And also the most acute social isolation and its associated problems of any first world country. I'm going to take you into Portland, Oregon now to show you our great experiment with that city. We looked at the city as a whole, we compared it to village-based cultures that have many more gathering places and ways to connect. We noticed by these comparisons that Portland alone was missing between 1,500 and 5,000 outdoor public gathering places. So we thought, okay, let's put one of them back and just see what would happen. In advance of this day when we came out to paint the street without permission, we were building these little structures in an adjacent yard about a block away, a place for neighborhood news a 24-hour tea station, a family-sized bench, a kid's clubhouse, a place for art and poetry, all these trading installations, a stage and a little library. And of course what we were doing was we were seeding a garden of the village. We were regrowing the village heart with all of the functions and amenities that you'll find. Go to Europe, go to Africa, you'll find all this vitality at the village heart. So we were saying we can have that too, we ought to have it. What we were doing was calling attention to the fact that we didn't have even one public square in the entire city, not one public living room, but we built one in Portland 
And it had this incredible catalytic effect. It was so inspirational to a city that it had never even known what this could be like. It said that there is a place where we all belong, where time and space is not for sale. It was so successful in building community, it's just the barn raising. It's not even a new idea. It's an old, old idea that is our absolute birthright. Get together, do something that uplifts the common life, build relationships that way, dance, eat together, wake up the next day with new ideas, not so afraid of each other or the world. So very logically here in the Sunnyside neighborhood, you see the neighborhood taking their emblem, the sunflower, their logo, and laying it down on the street. So it's a very exciting thing. You just build an example, people experience it spatially, and then they can start to talk about it, and then other people want to do it. That location doesn't even need a stop sign. People just come to a stop or they slow way down. The way we understand the effect is that they can see from a distance that it's different from everything else. So place is used to calm traffic instead of barriers. And it just calls out that people might be present. Those are small projects and so are these. And each one of them is really a node. It's a way that people co connect, intersect with each other. It's something that draws them, attracts them, gives them something to talk about. Here again, another household giving up part of their front yard to create a little gathering place for the community. So people actually perceiving that they can go over the lines and invite other people, even strangers, to come onto their space, to just linger for a while, overcoming their fears. This is called the Memorial Life House, where a young man named Matt Sheckle was crushed by a large truck that went through this stop sign. His bike was locked to the base of the stop sign and people kept bringing flowers and mementos. He was very popular in the alternative transportation culture. His mother would come and sit on the corner and cry. And finally, one of the neighbors, the woman who lives on this corner, who had held Matt when he was dying in his last few moments, she came out and invited people to just take a piece of her property and make a memorial to Matt's life. Poetry Plaza, a place where this woman in the green dress gives up her front yard for local students to come and write poems, for people to leave original poems in that little mailbox there, for people to just come and take and to leave. So this is where people are saying, I can give up this space that I have and enable other people to access it. This is one of the biggest things that we've ever done. This is a building that's entire, made out of all recycled and natural materials. Even the steel is recycled. It's a facility that takes stuff that's going to the dump, filters it, and sells it back to the public. Old two by fours, toilets, stuff like that. Tons and tons of stuff goes out of the waste stream, including what the building itself is made out of. But it's just profoundly important to embed our new understandings and visions and awarenesses as a society in the physical landscape around us so that we can see that our understandings are shared and that the world is changing.